Sydney. So, well, thank you again for being here. We won't keep you real long except uh, probably about 10. No, we'll get you out here at a good time and, and all of that. So everybody getting ready for their Thanksgiving plan in a few weeks. I already am. I plan on doing two, th three things. Eat, take a nap, and watch football. Wow, sounds like you guys have the same plan. <laughs> so, you know, they say this. I don't know if you know this, and those of you that are watching. So sometimes I give our, our, our three German shepherds some uh, uh, little bit of turkey. And man, just a little bit, they're out. Like, Because, you know, that's why people nap after they eat turkey, because there's some kind of like, is there something like in it that makes you, makes you tired? You know, so anyway, that's a different thing. I'm excited. All right, let's uh, open our Bibles today. We're going to do a little repeat, but we're going to get right into some other things that I felt like I was studying so, so many different things. And I was like, Lord, where do you want me to go? Because I want to hit as many things. And sometimes that's the challenge when you've been uh, away from the, the pulpit and kind of, you know, having to have so many other different events, I feel like you got to kind of recircle back around and different things. So Again, welcome those of you that are watching to Prophetic School. In Revelation chapter 4, in verse 1, I want you to look at what the call was. And I believe that this is a call that is why we're doing this prophetic school, because the Spirit of God is actually doing something. And if they'll put the scriptures up on the side as well for people to see and make sure that they can see them at home, that would be great. After this, I looked, and this is the Apostle John talking, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And notice the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me. And notice what heaven was asking or declaring. Come up higher. Do you know that that's what I believe the Spirit of God is saying right now? There's a call to come up higher, not to be a secular Christian, not to be a Christian that, you know, you can't tell the difference if you're, you know, worldly or godly. There's a, there's a call to come up higher and, and be about the things of God. But there's also a call to come up higher. Watch this. So that God can show us things which must come hereafter. That's why if you want to be a prophetic person and you want to have a prophetic spirit, you cannot be so inundated looking and, and, and literally consumed with everything that is on the news, in the newspapers, the headlines. Because if you do, what will happen is it will pull you to an earthly realm, an earthly revelation, rather than going up higher and getting God's perspective on things. So I've learned something. If you want to go higher in your prophetic gifting, if you want more visions, dreams, you want God's voice to speak to you, you want to hear God, you want to speak for God, you have to have a certain determination and lifestyle that you answer the call, that you are a heavenly minded, you are driven for the things of God, and you're not always just putting your head into whatever the media is saying and all the negative things that are going on. You will never have the right prophetic spirit if you do that. If you want to go higher, then come up where he is. And I promise you, you will see. Notice the thing that happened. If you choose to come up higher, if you choose to be a spiritual person, you choose to read your Bible, you choose to pray in the spirit, you choose to seek the face of God. Notice the promise. I will show you things which must come hereafter. I have people often say to me, Pastor Hank, I don't feel like I hear God anymore. I used to flow in the gifts of the Spirit. And I always say it to him this way. Have you ever made Kool-Aid before? How many of you, you have young people in here, you don't even know what Kool-Aid is. But, <laughs> you know, or let's just say you'd make some kind of, you know, refreshing drink of, for, for kids, right? You would take the Kool-Aid packet and you would put it in like, I don't know, what was it, like a gallon of water, a pitcher of water. And then you would put like 10 scoops of sugar and you would put it into this container. 
and you would stir it and the Kool-Aid packet with the 10 scoops of sugar and the water in the pitcher would make this thing called Kool-Aid and man was that amazing. And then if you really wanted to, you'd put it in ice trays with toothpicks in it and you'd freeze it for later. You remember that? How many remember that? How many of you over, you're over 50, you're okay. How many of you are 30 below, 30 below, 30 and below? How many of you are 35 and under? You don't even have any idea what I'm talking about, do you? All right, now here, and those of you that are watching, you have no clue, you have no clue. But here's the point. If you would leave that Kool-Aid in that uh, pitcher and walk away and come back, all of the ingredients would begin to settle to the bottom. That's why it says Paul declared to Timothy, his son, stir up the gifts of God that have been given to you. And one of the ways to stir up the gift, it's not that you, you, well, you used to flow in the gifts or you used to hear God greater, because I guarantee you, if you go back, you probably had more of a first love for God. You were probably more dedicated to reading the word. You probably were more consistent in your devotions. You probably spent more time with the Lord. And usually when there's a disconnect where you're not getting constant revelation, you're not hearing God, you're not sensing him, you're not seeing things, always go back and plug in greater. Check your cords, right? Check your connection. And I promise you, his reward was come up higher, and I'm going to show you things, all right? So you want to go deeper? Come up higher. Change your lifestyle. Change things that you're doing. Plug greater into heaven, and I promise you, you will see a greater download that comes. All right, I want you to look at Acts chapter 2, and I want you to look at verse 16 through 19. I just want to lay a little bit of a foundation. Oftentimes when people are talking about the last days, they don't often like to talk this stuff. They always talk about the beast, the antichrist, the mark of the beast, and tribulation. But look at the promise of the last days. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, that in the last days saith the Lord, I will pour out my spirit. So rather than looking for a global tribulation, why don't we look for a global outpouring? And that's where my eyes are on. I'm like, God, I'm not on this earth, you know, to just sit there and be in fear. I'm in this earth to be part of the last great outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And notice, notice the increase of prophetic revelation. Watch this. I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall what? Prophesy. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall, shall dream dreams. I mean, this is amazing. He's saying, look at all the prophetic revelation that's going to happen in the last days. Look at verse 18. It says, and on my servants and on my handmaidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. So what is one of the markings of the last days? The outpouring of the Holy Spirit, signs, wonders, miracles. But watch this, an increase of the prophetic. So if God's calling us to come up higher, man, we are ready and willing and able to have those prophetic utterances, prophetic words, visions, and dreams. All right, let's, let's go on. Now, I want you to look at 1 Corinthians 12, 28. Look at what God has set in the church. And this is why I wouldn't be going, those of you that are watching online, to some dead church somewhere, you know. Uh, one of the commands to, to, to Joshua and to the people is when you see the ark, leave the place where you're at and go after it. Sometimes we waste our time at churches that have no absolute desire to let God move. Here's how you know. When they make everything about you, when everything is about you, come as you are, you are welcome, you are this, you are that, just doing life with you, just be you. Well, you know why? I, you go to those churches and you never, you never feel him because it's all about you. And when you make your church and your life about God, he will come. It's not about us. I'm not here because of of me. I'm here. I want God. And as a result, God, I want you to bless the people. So you have to understand when you're looking for a church, here's a good list. God has set some in the church, first apostles. Okay. Those are governmental men of authority, women of authority. 
And we'll get into subjects about women in ministry. Believe me, we are going to hit it because there's such a religious devil that would love to make you think that women can't say anything. I mean, some of you women, you just violated some of the religious spirits. They tell you to be quiet in the church. There you go. You just... <laughs> Second, prophets, right? So there's prophets in the church. Thirdly, teachers. The problem is most uh, churches you go to, you, all you see is teachers. You don't see any prophetic move. You don't see any prophet. You don't ever hear any prophetic utterances. You don't uh, find apostolic authority and order. Then after that, miracles and gifts of healing. Helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Yeah, speaking in tongues. So notice how when God set these things in the church, it was for the purpose of the supernatural. God wants the supernatural, and he wants you to be part of that supernatural. Now, I want you to look here. Let's talk about prophets, because one of the things that the Bible says that God puts in the church is prophets. How many of you saw that? Now, what do prophets do? I want you to look at Amos 3.7. Again, I'm just making a little repetitive stuff here. In Amos 3.7, surely the Lord God will do what? Nothing. But that he reveals his secret or his secrets. Now, I've often asked myself, why is it singular, secret, and not plural? Now, maybe other translations that might have it be you know, plural. Because here is a principle that you have to understand about prophets in the Bible. They were called the friends of God. And the reason they were called the friends of God is because they had a unique relationship with God that wasn't based on their gifting, their words. It was based on they wanted God. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. So surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he reveals his secret. What's his secret? Can I tell you what his secret is? It's his heart. You get God's heart, and he will talk. You get God's heart, and he will show you things to come. You get his heart, and I tell you what, he will share things with you, and at times he'll tell you to be quiet and don't share it with anybody. Sometimes he shows me things in the earth that I know ahead of time is coming, and I want so bad to say it, but I can't because I have his secret. I have his secret. I have his heart. And I'm not going to violate his heart. Because if I violate his heart, I violate trust. And I'm going to show you how important building trust is with God. If God can trust you, he will share his secret, his heart. And out of that will come secrets. Notice the job of the prophets. Their job is to be servants. Too many people want to be served, right? They want to be noticed with their gift. Well, you serve God and you be a servant, okay? The reason I want to hear God is not so that people can glorify the gifting, the utterance. I want to serve God. I want to help people. You know, in a crazy time that we're living in, confusion, you know, what is truth? I always say it to God. God, your heart, your secret demands a voice. I'm not the only one, but God, I'm honored to be one of them. But, Lord, here's the deal. The people, it demands that they hear your heart, your secret. It demands that they receive truth. Right? right? And so I want you to understand that. Now, let's talk about this because, you know, for example, when the Israeli war happened, people were writing uh, in on social media, well, how come no prophet heard this? Well, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. God does nothing in the earth unless he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets. And, and, and our ministry, we, we had God speak. You can look at those prophecies. We'll talk about them on November 15th coming up. Uh, there were prophecies from April 16th and April 30th. God said in the days ahead, there's going to be a strike against Israel. He said September 14th or 15th at our conference, Iran would be involved in a strike regarding Israel. So just because you didn't hear it didn't mean that God didn't speak it. Don't just assume, well, see, the prophets, they missed it. I don't believe in all this prophetic stuff. Nobody heard this. Well, wait a minute. Maybe you didn't hear it. But I guarantee you somewhere there was a prophetic utterance, a prophetic warning, a prophetic message somewhere that God was saying it. Amen. 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 Do you know there was in our church, and I don't know if, if any of you would be here, but six months before Columbine happened, I was caught up in a vision and I was taken over the schools in the United States of America and I saw the spirit of terror. And guess where it came from? It came from Y2K fear. 
That's what the Lord said because I got a lot of heat back in 1999 when I had a visitation from the Lord. It was on my son's birthday, August 23rd of 1999. And the Lord, I had a visitation. He said, you tell the people Y2K will not be as they are prognosticating, as they are declaring. And I said, well, Lord, do we need to store up? He said, don't waste your time. So what he told me, and boy, we, we were on the radio back then. We had people writing hate mail and all kinds of stuff. We even had one pastoral guy write and said, well, what are you going to do when you have deceived your people and, and you have no food and no water and, and, and they have nowhere to go? Well, I would have loved to have gone to his church and flickered his lights, you know. <laughs> but, but here's what God said. In the visitation, he said, that the spirit of fear was trying to cross the new millennial line ahead of the momentum of the church. And as a result, God said the fear would be terror. And you look at what happened shortly after. The Y2K, where people just absolutely hook, line, and sinker, absolutely dove into fear-mongering. We've never, we've never been able to, to recapture a certain level of fear. In fact, I think it's gotten greater. Okay, how many are you hearing that? So my point is, look, God did speak it. Sometimes either you didn't hear it, you don't believe it, right? Or here's another one. When, when Columbine happened, man, I didn't know what to do. I'm hearing this, and I, and I remember it that night. I'm like, I'm, I, I, I said, guys, I see Colorado, and I see this word Columbine. I don't even know what to do, so we prayed. That's the best thing you can do. But sometimes I've heard things and, and, and I refuse to speak it. There are times where I have been in a meeting and I've heard God speak to me and he said something and I was so afraid of the faces of the people. I didn't want to be written up again and misunderstood. And I held on to it. And I, and I would have to go back and I've had to go back and I've had to deal with God. He said, either you're going to speak for me or you're not. Are you going to speak it? I'm trying, Lord, I'm trying. But you know what? And he's very patient. He's very good. But here's the point. Sometimes it's not that God didn't reveal his secrets. Again, either you didn't know of it, God spoke it, but you didn't, you didn't receive it because you didn't understand it, or maybe the vessel didn't communicate it. So, all right, but it's never on God's part. Never on God's part. All right, I want to get into some other things here. I want you to look at Jeremiah chapter 1. And I want you to look about the, the prophet real quick. That's something that is a very, you know what, let me, before we do that, let's go back to Ezekiel 7. I want to hit this one, actually. I just want to make sure I have enough time to share what I really want to kind of get into. In Ezekiel 7, notice what the job of the, of the prophet is. This is why when people come against the prophetic movement or they come against, you know, certain uh, prophets that are true prophets, the legitimacy of the prophetic ministry today, they don't realize that God has set it into the earth for a benefit. Now, I like, I think it is, and I don't often like to quote from the NIV because I think the NIV is very inaccurate on many of its, its uh, translations. But I do want to put up the NIV because I do believe, as I've looked over different translations, that it says what I really think it needs to say, and that is this. It says disaster upon disaster. So this one says mischief upon mischief. They can keep it up there, but, but other translations say disasters upon disasters. How many are seeing disasters in the earth? Okay, how many are seeing mischief? So you can keep that verse of King James up there. But then there's also rumor shall be upon rumors. How many rumors are out there? Conspiracies, all kinds of crazy things. People don't know what to hear. All right, that's what our... Our society is right now, people are like, I don't know what to believe. There's a lot of disasters, a lot of mischief, a lot of rumors. Then they shall seek a vision of the prophet. But notice the law shall perish from the priest. In other words, the word of God is not even going to be mentioned, spoken, even from the priesthood. And even the counsel from the ancients. In other words, you're not going to be able to find godly counsel. You're not even going to be able to hear biblical truth. And uh, there's going to come a time where God's going to say, look... I'm sharing my heart. I'm revealing what I want to do in the earth, and I'm doing it through my prophets. Okay? That's how God chooses in times of mischief, times of disaster, when there's a lot of rumors, people don't know what to hear. He will always inject his secrets, his secret into the earth so that you know what is true and what 
is going to happen, right? Jeremiah 29, 11 is written for a nation. I have plans for you to give you hope, to give you a future. But one of the ways God does it is through prophets. He gives you hope. He gives you a future. And watch this, to give you an expected end. We're not always having to guess how things are going to turn out. God wants to tell us ahead of time, this is how this is going to turn out. This is what I want you to do, but you need to pray. I remember when God kept prophesying about Netanyahu. He's, he's going to be raised up again. And, and people were writing, oh, don't you know that this indictment and this and that, and he's done this and that. And yet God never changed his mind. God never changed his word coming out of this mouth. And he kept saying, I'm going to raise him up. He's going to be a bulwark. He's going to stand even when they try to come through tunnels, even when they try to come and strike Israel. I will raise up this man who will be like it was with David at Ziglag. He's going to pursue He's going to overtake, and without fail, he's going to recover all. How many understand that? So God will raise up prophetic voices so that we do know the outcome of what is going to happen in the earth. Now, I want you to go over to uh, Jeremiah chapter 1, and I want you to see what prophets <clears throat> absolutely are set to do. Now, not every prophet is set to be uh, a prophet of events, okay? I've, uh, I, I've seen some uh, prophetic voices, um, and this is just my opinion. Um, I'm not. I'm not calling anybody out, but I've watched where some prophetic uh, voices uh, in the past, and sometimes even today, they're more of an echo. They they they're not graced to speak nationally. They're not called to really be a prophet over America or over the nations or the nations, but they feel like they have to jump on the bandwagon. And do so. That's why a lot of them started apologizing when the heat got on. Because did you really hear it? Because if you really have the heart of God, the most sacred thing that can be given to you, the heart of God, and he shares a secret with you, and he tells you something, you have to hold on to that word until he tells you otherwise. Not because it looks like it's wrong, you feel the pressure from the people. Chances are you probably really didn't hear it. Because I know when I hear something, and I know that I know, I don't give a royal rat's rump what anybody writes, what anybody says. I only care that I'm honoring him and that I'm sticking to what he said and I'm not backing off. Because I've seen too many prophecies come to pass. But what I'm saying is people step into a place that is not, they're not graced to be. And the, and the latest thing is this, you know, let's give national words. Let's, you know, be careful. You don't want to step into an authority that has not been given to you by Jesus, the Lord of the church. It's very dangerous. Jesus is the one that sets prophets in the church. And when he sets them in the church, it's him who gives what's called positional authority and grace. You don't position yourself. Jesus talked about that in Luke 14. He said, if you go marching up to the front row of the seat of prophet over the nation, prophet to America, and God hasn't positioned you there, he hasn't seated you there, you're going to get moved. You're going to get embarrassed because you don't have the invited grace or invitation by the Holy One to sit there. And so you're going to get moved. And that's what he talks about. How many of you ever, uh, you saw an open seat in front of an event or table and then you get moved. Have you ever had that happen to you? I had that happen to me at a Benny Hinn meeting. I was like 22, man. And, and there was an open seat, and I was so excited. I ran to the front, sat down in the seat, and I'm like, oh, yeah. Come on, God. And all of a sudden, the usher right in front of everybody on the microphone, hey, um, you, you need to move. That's for Benny Hinn's team. Who's he talking to? And then you act like you, you dropped a quarter. Oh, I... I you know, just <laughs> so weird, so and you, with a red face, go walking away. I was like 22. I was stupid. But anyway, look at Jeremiah 1. Don't do that stuff, man. And don't do it in the spirit. Before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. And I, and, 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 and I knew you. And before you came forth out of, your, out of the womb, I sanctified thee and I ordained you as a prophet unto the nations. So, okay, so right there, who was the one that gave him the call? Did he come out because he could now have a podcast and decide that he's, you know, got followers, and so now I'm going to start prophesying about national events because I'm listening to what other people are saying. And listen, there's a couple people that I have to watch sometimes because whatever I prophesy, they come out with it about a, uh, within about two to three days later, and I'm like, you know, 
can you ever just get it yourself? And so I just quit listening to them. So anyway, and, and maybe they're getting deposited. I don't know. But before I formed thee in the belly, I knew you. So I called you to be a prophet unto the nations. So what is their calling? A prophet to the nations. Now I want you to, for those of you that are taking notes, to realize that there are different kinds of prophetic um, positioning by Jesus. There's prophets to nations, Jeremiah 1.10. There's prophets to the body of Christ where they will never prophesy necessarily. I'm not saying that God will never give them a word, but they are a prophet to the body of Christ where they always have a, a word for what God is saying to his church. It's not so much the nation, okay? I've watched you, John, many years get words for the body of Christ and for the church. I've even seen you tap into things even into events, you go in and out. But there are some folk where, you know, they will just literally, absolutely, man, they are hearing God for his church. Okay, I met a prophet over the body of Christ the other day. He said, man, God showed me the church is waking up. The remnant is the one that is causing the church to be awakened. And he was sharing some other things. I was like, man, you are right in line with what I sense. There's prophets to the local church. Okay, and by the way, body of Christ is Acts 15, 32. Uh, Acts 13, 1, you remember uh, Saul, before he was named Paul, uh, he was Saul, and he was learning in the church of Antioch, and he was a teacher, and he was a prophet, and he was functioning in the local church. And the reason why a local church connection, if you want to grow prophetically, is because it, it gives you an opportunity to be groomed. It gets you an opportunity to do what I call Jesus' first miracle, the governor of the feast, where you're being fed has an opportunity to do a taste test on your character, taste test on how about your marriage, uh, how you handle your money, how you handle your morality, a taste test, how about this, on how your character is, but how about your gifting? And not just in your gifting, but how do you display your gifting? I told you years ago, I had to have somebody correct me because I would prophesy accurate words in the church but they had to come and say, Pastor Hank, you walk like a chicken when you prophesy. Please don't tell me I still do that. But I didn't realize I was, thus saith the Lord. Or, ur, 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 ur. Okay. You don't want to do that. He said, he said, it's hindering your gift. Okay, so there was prophets over local churches, prophets over events. There are prophets that God will speak to them about specific events. Uh, Agabus uh, had a prophecy about a famine. There's prophets. Uh, uh, prophets or prophecy to individuals. You know, I know some, now just because you prophesy to an individual doesn't mean you're a prophet, but I have seen that there are certain prophets that they'll never prophesy a word to the body of Christ. They'll never prophesy, but they are prophets, man. They have a gift and a grace to speak to individuals. You know, I used to prophesy over individuals a lot more than I do now. And I asked the Lord about it. I said, God, and he was the one that told me, he said, and he said, unless I move you that direction, Hank, I need your attention and your ear and your voice, your words, your mouth, your tongue. I need it over the nation. I need it over the nations of the earth. I used to travel 40 to 50 times out of the country to foreign nations a year. And God said to me, he said, for right now, you are to be in America, and uh, you are to not be so much this way, but you are to be this way and then this way, whatever I tell you. And so if I'm constantly trying to do this all the time and prophesy to individuals, I will step out of a certain grace that God has called me to. I have to hear, I have to watch, and I have to speak what God is saying at a, at a level that is what he's asking me to do. Does that make sense? Now, it doesn't mean I don't prophesy over people. or I, I, it just, I used to do it a lot more. What happened? You have to understand assignments and responsibilities change. Don't just keep doing something because you've always done it that way. That's how you get into, that's why camps get into <laughs> becoming dead. Because yeah, you've already been going around the mountain the whole time. And God says, I... I've been wanting you to go to your promised land, and you keep going around the same old mountain doing the same old thing. So I always try to listen to God on what am I supposed to do. It's not my gift. It's yours. It's not my office. It's yours. Okay? Always remember. All right, now let's go on to the next one. Look here. This, this is what I want to get into tonight. Look at uh, Jeremiah 1, 7 through 9. And whatever I command you, 
you shall speak. Okay, notice it's a command. You are under orders from heaven. That doesn't mean you go up rudely and you say, thus saith the Lord, I'm under uh, orders from heaven to, to speak. Now, I've had very rare opportunity or uh, times as a prophet where I've had to because somebody wasn't listening. They were in rebellion. They were in danger. And if I didn't tell them, they were going to hurt themselves or something would really happen. And, I, and I've had people when I would tell them, say, you know, I've got to tell you, I'm under orders from heaven. I have to tell you this. This bothers me to tell you this, but I have to tell you this, and you're not going to like it. And I've had them, you know, I've had them spit in my face. And, um, you know, one guy did. He, he uh, spit in my face and then called me false, and um, he was dead within a week. But here's the point. You have to be very, very under authority but you also don't use that, don't take that as a liberty where I'm under command of God, I have to speak this. I know people that go up to pastors and try to rebuke them. Well, they're totally out of order. You know, don't do that kind of stuff. But there is a certain sacredness to where when you begin to walk with God that you will feel compelled. You know how I know that God speaks to me and I'm under orders from heaven? Is he's very patient with me. You know what he does with me? Is my, I literally feel this sensation inside of me like, I, it's like, you ever had it where like you're getting ready to speak or something, and you're like, oh, you know, or you're getting ready to run a race. You feel this in continual intensity, and it's almost like God is putting his thumb on me. You have to say it. There's so many times I'm standing over there, and, and, and I feel, I don't want to say my heart races because it doesn't, but I can feel this constant press of God on me. Hank, you have to say this. This has to come out. And sometimes I only know a, a piece of it. I don't know the whole thing. So you have to just kind of prime the pump and then let it come. How many of you ever had that happen to you? Okay. Now watch this. The part I want you to hear is, look at this. Be not afraid of their faces. If you want to flow in the prophetic and you want to be accurate, you got to be careful because you're always going to have a critic. Now, if the pastor tells you don't prophesy in his church to people, don't prophesy in the parking lot, all right, that's his church. It's his people. You need to honor that. But what I'm talking about is there comes a point where you cannot let fear keep you from being used of God. It's the thing that I pointed out in Romans 8, where it says that those that are the children of God, you know, you're led by the Spirit, you're children of God, and you've not been given the spirit of bondage again unto fear. Well, why did it mention fear in the same context of being led by the Spirit? Because too many people are afraid to trust that God will speak to you, that God will show you things. God will reveal things to you. So you don't be moved by their faces, but watch this. For I am with you to deliver you, saith the Lord. And then the Lord put forth his hand, and watch this, touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I've put my words in your mouth. So you could say it this way. Go over to 2 Kings chapter 4. You could say one of the things that God does is he, it's called face-to-face, heart-to-heart, mouth to mouth. People often say to me, Pastor Hank, how do I increase the voice of God? How do I get more visions and dreams? I already told you, come up higher. All right. Now, when you come up higher, when you are determined that you're going to come up higher in your spiritual walk, in your spiritual determination, your spiritual drive, um, when you determine that you are going to literally go to another level in the things of God, one of the things um, that you have to make sure that you do is what the Apostle John realized. And I'm going to show you that, and it's this. It's not so much about your prophetic words. It's more about him who's seated on the throne. When you make it about God, you will go up to a whole another level. Now, I'm going to show you a key. Look at 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 31 through 36. How do you get God to put his words in your mouth. How do you get God to share his heart with you so that you can be a vessel? You can be used of God. Okay. Now watch this. Ge Gehazi hurried on ahead and laid the staff on the child's face. Now this part always, it's amazing me. I, I've studied and studied and studied looking for a reason, but nothing happened. Come on. Have you ever had something that you felt to do prophetically? And it never happened. It never came to pass. Have you ever prophesied something and for whatever reason it didn't work? 
Have you ever felt like you were supposed to do something, you know, that you felt like you heard God say, but ultimately nothing happened, no results? Okay, in this case, for whatever reason, he was told by the prophet, grab the staff and go. And, and, and the staff, it didn't work. There was no power. There was no manifestation. There was no results. And I've had that happen before in my life where, you know, I, I thought, man, I'm really hearing God. And turned out, for whatever reason, it didn't work. And so I don't quit. I just go back and say, Lord, you know what? I need you to teach me. And sometimes God will tell me why it worked and why it didn't work. And sometimes I just have to, I guess I'm going to find out one day. I've had that happen where I prayed for people in the hospital and I felt like I heard a word and they went on to heaven. I remember one time, man, there was one lady where she called me on the phone and she was hysterical. And uh, a friend of hers or a relative had, had died. And uh, uh, no, not died. They were in a coma. And they, the doctor said that she was going to die. And uh, this friend of mine called me and said, listen, uh, this person's in a coma. And uh, Hank, the doctors are saying that any minute she's going to die. And she's in this coma. She doesn't know the Lord. And I said, hold it. I said, I said, there's a problem. They said, what's the problem? I said, too many people in the room. Get everybody out of the room and do it now. All right? And, and command her to wake up and then preach the gospel and she'll get saved. In fact, the Lord said she'll die at 1130. She calls me back. This was like 9 in the morning. Calls me back. Says, Pastor Hank, it's not working. It's not working. I've done it. She's still in a coma. And I thought, what? Is, what is that? Hmm. And she goes, and we're only about an hour and a half away from when you said that she's going to die or whatever it was. And it bothered me. I'm like, man, I can't. This is no time to miss God. And all of a sudden I heard the Holy Spirit say, she didn't do what you said. And I said, are people still in the room? Yeah, I don't have the heart to tell them to leave. I said, well, you called me and you don't have the heart to tell them to leave. You better have a heart like you said that that person is going to die at 1130 without God. Get him out of the house. Get him out of the room. Okay. She got him out. The, 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 the person woke up. Led her to Jesus. And she died exactly when God said she would. Closed her eyes and in heaven. See, you talk about getting to heaven by the hair, your chinny, chin, chin. But... <laughs> Again, it messed with me because I'm like, you know, so there are times where you put a staff on, you pray a prayer, and it doesn't work. But there's also times where there's a reason. Are we following instructions? Are we really, you know, putting our interpretation on things and so forth? I remember there was a girl that used to go to this church years ago, her family, and they moved. But uh, they gave her less than, I think, 8% or 5%. Do you all remember that? Maybe it was less than 3%. I don't know. Three to, it was less than 10-something, one of the numbers. And there was no visible sign and change in this little premature baby. <clears throat> and one day I was getting ready to come to church, and I heard the Holy Spirit say, Hank, I need you to do something for me before church. I need you, or after church, go and rock this baby. So I said, okay. And I went up to the hospital, and you know what was so crazy is the doctor said, no, we really can't take her out of her incubator. You're going to make her life uh, be too much at risk. And I said, well, you already said she had less than 10%. <laughs> okay, you already left her up to die. So what do you got to lose? And he said, well, you, we just need parental consent. And the mom said, sure. And, I, and I, I'll never forget that day. They handed me that little baby. It was the smallest little baby I ever held. And, the Lord, and I said, Lord, what do you want me to do? He said, rock. And every time you rock, and every time you move, I will breathe life. And this child's like 20-something today. But you see, sometimes you just have to follow with what God says. Faith without works. You know, and, and I've learned this by when you're submitted. See, I, I've submitted myself. I don't just be a, a renegade. That's the worst mistake you can make. God won't trust you and people won't trust you. If you push yourself and you push your gift. I made that mistake early on in my life. I was trying to push my gift a little too much. And I'm telling you, it, 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 it never goes right. You're better off to let God promote you. And so when you do hear specific things, people don't just think you're being a squirrel. They'll, they'll trust you. All right? How many are you getting that? Now, look here. 
All right, so it didn't work. There was no sign of life. And he returned to meet Elisha, and he told him, the child is still dead. Let's keep reading. When Elisha arrived, the child was indeed dead, lying there on the prophet's bed. He went in alone, and he shut the door behind him and prayed to the Lord. Stop right there. All right. Now, most people want to hear from God. Most people want to come up higher. But you know what? They'll never shut the door behind them. They keep a door open to worldliness, compromise, flesh, sin, their friends, their cheeky, you know, club. And they don't close the door. They're, 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 it's like they keep this connection. You know, it's what happened to Lot's wife. Obviously, there was something in her that she just had to look over her shoulder to make sure. Well, it cost her her life because there was something in her. You know, make sure that if you want to go higher and you really want to see God supernaturally use you, that you don't leave open doors to where the enemy can come in. Don't leave open doors because what it will do is it will keep you from really tapping into a higher place with God. Shut the door and prayed to the Lord. Now, watch what happens. This is a principle I want to teach you. Then he laid down on the child's body. Okay, now, so imagine Elijah laying down on top of this, this little boy's body. I had that happen to me by a guy that's in heaven now. His name was Prophet uh, Ed Dufresne. He was a very powerful prophet. And he would pull me out of audiences. He didn't even know me. And he would throw me up against walls and, and command the power of God to come on me, the, the anointing. But I remember one service, he picked me up and threw me across the room. And then I was laid on the ground, and he laid on the side and put his chest from the side right here and breathed and groaned in the spirit for a long, long time. I have no clue to this day what was imparted in my life, but I just know when I got off the ground, I felt different. But here's what was happening. The child's body, okay, was underneath Elijah. You know what that was? That was heart to heart. Okay, that was what the most important way, if you want God to speak to you, it's always heart to heart first. Okay, the first thing he did is lay down on the child's body. The first thing you need to do is lay your life down because you've shut the door. You're praying to God. You're laying down before the Lord and you are trying to have heart to heart. I go after the heart of God. I don't seek for prophetic words. I seek his heart. Now, I'm going to show you how to seek his heart because it's important. Now, the next thing is he placed his mouth on the child's mouth. So now, okay, once you get God's heart, get ready because the next thing, God's going to start speaking to you, right? When you come up higher, Revelation 4.1, then I'll show you things which must come hereafter. And I'm going to show you another principle with John. Then he put his eyes upon his eyes, okay? That's prophetic sight. God's going to show you things. You're going to get visions and dreams. But the first thing you need to do is you need to place yourself before the Lord, heart to heart. That's what that represents, body to body, heart to heart. Then God's going to start speaking to you. You're going to start seeing things. You're going to get visions and dreams. And then his hands were on the child's hands. Now you're going to be able to serve effectively, purely in your gift. That's why it says in the book of Acts, I believe it's Acts 20 or 21, where it talks about that Philip had four virgin daughters that prophesied. Why would it mix virginity with their prophetic gift? Because that is the highest level that you can function in, is when you are pure in the heart, you'll see God. When you're pure in the heart, you'll speak for God. When you're pure in the heart, right, you're going to be able to tap into a whole other level of heavenly information and revelation that's entrusted to you by God. Amen? Amen? And then as a result, the child, you know, came uh, to life. But I want you to see this. Now, let's look here. So the first thing you see is, you see, heart to heart, face to face. This is the desire or what I call the pursuit of intimacy. So the first thing Elijah does when he comes in the room, I just showed you and those of you that are watching, body to body, heart to heart, face to face. Okay? This is the most important thing that it has to be your drive. God, I want your face. Now, when you get God's face, he reveals his heart. Come on, how many ever been uh, on a date? How many ever been married, right? 
First thing you do is you see your, your, the face of the person that you're going out with. And then as you continue to pursue them, as they continue to watch you, listen to you, they open their heart. Same way with God. You see, his face, when it comes to seeking his face, one thing I always say to God is, okay, and I always say, God, I'm here to seek your face, all right? And I look and I, and I think, okay, man, his hair is it's, it's so beautiful. Well, God, your, your hair is so full of glory and, and wisdom. And God, I want that glory and I want that wisdom that is reflected upon your head. And then I look in his eyes and I'm like, God, I want, I want to see things the way that you see things. That means I'm going to hate what you hate. And I'm going to love what you love and because I'm after your eyes. I'm not looking at it from my perspective, but God, I'm, I'm looking at it from yours. And I already told you this on one of the prophetic schools. One of the craziest things I had happen to me one time as I was praying and these eyes appeared before me. It was so intense and I knew they were the eyes of the Lord. And he spoke and he said, there are some who uh, call themselves that are prophets and they are not. And he said, there are some that are uh, saying they're operating in word of knowledge, but it is prior knowledge. I will expose them. And then he said this. He said, now come. I want to show you. And all of a sudden, I was pulled inside of <laughs> whatever this happened to me. And I was no longer looking at the eyes like, you know, in front of me, but I was now inside. You know, how many of you know the Bible says we are in Christ? I don't know. But I was somewhere where I was now looking through his eyes and he began to show me the earth and he began to show me things in the earth. That's another reason why I'm not moved by the future. I saw it. I saw it. Are you saying Jesus isn't coming? I didn't say that. I'm telling you, I saw the future and it's up to him when he decides the king to come. But I'm telling you, I saw the darkness. I prophesied about the plague, but I also saw rest I saw light. I saw a reset. I saw reversals. I saw crazy things. It's like you didn't even recognize the earth. It was so different because of God invading it. But I was literally caught up, and I was able to see uh, through his eyes, and it changed my whole perspective. It, it changed my whole life. The other thing is when you look at the face of God, you see his nose. God, you know, I want to, I, I, I want to know the sweet aroma. Okay, I want to I have a life that is a sweet aroma. You know, I want to be able to smell when something is off and evil, but I also, God, want to celebrate righteousness because when the earth was clean in Genesis 8, the Bible says God smelled it, right? If you want to hear from God, what's the fragrance you're giving off? You know, then, of course, you know, I look for the Lord's mouth. I want his mouth. I want his lips. I want his breath. You know, I, I, I want his touch. And, and so when you want the words of God, his mouth, if you will make it about his face and his heart, just like with Elisha, he put his heart face to face, boom, the next thing, it was the eyes, it was the hands, come on, and you can understand that, and, and it was the mouth, and you can see how it progresses, all right, and I want to show you this, this is an incredible principle, are you ready? So you got to have heart to heart, this is the key, go after God's face, Write that down. Go after his face. God, I want your face. And he'll give you his heart. Well, what's his heart? His mind, his will, okay? His intentions, okay? His delights, his secrets. And you know what? I put an equal sign in my notes. You know what I put? It equals prophetic words, prophetic revelation. Whenever I make my time, you know, like New Year's Eve service, you know, there's a lot of pressure. What's God going to say? You know what? If... This 2024, God doesn't say anything through this vessel. I'm good. But I feel it because I feel the responsibility. But what am I doing before I ever get out here? I'm saying, God, I would love for you to speak to the people. But I, I long for him. I long to, I, I worship him. I tell him how much I love him and how much I want him to speak to the people and how much we need to know what the future looks like and, and what does he have planned. And if you make it about his face, he will give you his heart. And then all of a sudden, boom, mouth to mouth, God starts putting words in your mouth. The problem that a lot of people do is they go after the, the mouth. They go after the words. Come on, it's like trying to kiss the girl on the first date. Wait a minute. Don't touch those lips, right? We do the same thing with, with God. We want all these words, and yet, what about his eyes? What about, what about his precious heart? And when you make it about his face and his heart, he will fill your mouth with his words. 
Don't make it about prophecies, prophetic words, filling a podcast, trying to, you know, come up with, you know, the list of all the, you know, 10 things that will happen in 2024. I quit doing that. I said I am not into prediction, even though prophets have a predictive, uh, 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 predictive, how would I say it? There's prediction in the foretelling of the way the gift manifests. But you don't seek for predictions. No, I seek his face. And if he reveals something to me, I'll share it. Otherwise, zip the lip and go after the heart. All right? Now, look at uh, Numbers chapter 12. This is very, very important. And I'm going to read this out of the New Living Translation. I want to teach you some principles out of this. i got to go kind of quick here. While they were at Hezeroth, Miriam and Aram criticized Moses because he married a Cushite woman. So notice they were criticizing and they said, has the Lord spoken only through Moses? This is a dangerous thing. Hasn't he also spoken through us too? Or doesn't he speak to us? Never compare yourself with another prophetic vessel or another gift. If you do, it will ruin you. That's why I bring great prophetic voices in. And I'm not in competition with them. Okay? They have different administrations. They have different giftings. And a lot of them are greater than what God has given to this vessel. I don't care. I'm not in competition. I'm not the only one that God speaks through. But if you always compare yourself, you're going to get into verse 1. You're going to get into criticism. And let me tell you about the danger of criticism. If you criticize everything, okay, a prophetic word comes out and you don't like it, you don't understand it, you don't agree with it. It's amazing how many people criticize a prophetic word before it ever, ever manifests when I was prophesying about Netanyahu would return to power, they started criticizing. I'm like, man, it hasn't even manifest yet, and you are acting like you are the judge of the earth. You're acting like you are God, and you are the one that is determining whether he's going to come back or not. And they get into criticism. And what happens when you get into criticism and comparing, you will get off in your gift, and you will begin to be critical. And your prophecies will become critical. You will have a judgmental sound in the way you prophesy and what you prophesy. Man, I've had some people that I hear them prophesy. I'm like, you know what? Your words are right, but the spirit behind what you're saying is off because you are critical. And you've gotten over in a religious spirit that, that nobody can do anything good. So everybody's going to go to hell and God's judgments are here and they never can see anything good. So be careful of criticizing. Now, watch this. God says something that is so amazing. Look at verse 3. Now, watch this. And they, now Moses was very humble, more than any other person on earth. Why did God put that in there? Because sometimes when we are critical, we are in pride. I watch people go after true prophets of God and criticize them recently over the last year. And it was just ugly what it did to the body of Christ. But yet Moses, and yet I'm thinking the vessels that they, that they attacked, I'm like, these people are meek, they're humble. They're not out to deceive and to be false and blah, blah, blah. But there was a certain element and a pride that came with the criticism. Notice God called out humility. I have a friend of mine, Clint, he's like probably 85 years old, and I've known him for 25 years, and the thing he would say to me every single time I'd get with him, be humble, stay humble. Humility, there is power in humility. Now, have you ever prayed about something and you wonder why? I was rebuking the devil one day, and he wasn't buking. And I went to God. I said, the devil's not buking. I'm rebuking him, but he's not buking. And God said, Hank, I give grace to the humble but I resist the proud. He said, it's not even the devil. It's me resisting you. You are in pride. Humble yourself. Now, pride also gives access to the devil. So stay out of pride. Don't think that you have the greatest gift. Don't think that you're the church prophet. You're the parking lot prophet. You're the dreamer in the church, and you got to submit all your dreams to everybody, right? You know everything. I, listen, I, if people prophesy to me, I always say, what church you, you belong to? Who, who, who are you connected to? Jesus said you know prophets by their what? Fruit. So you look at a fruit and you have to look at the root. What are you rooted into? 
right? Are you a squirrel? Who do you listen to on the internet? Sometimes people tell me who they listen to and who, and who they follow. I'm like, hell no, don't you dare share a word with me. <laughs> and I'm not cussing, I'm just saying, it, 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 I, don't, I don't want it coming from the underground. <laughs> okay, look, look at verse 4. Are you bored tonight? No. Oh, okay. So immediately the Lord called to Moses and Aaron and Miriam and said, so now you got three. Go out to the tabernacle, all three of you. So the three went to the tabernacle. Keep reading. Watch what happens. Then the Lord descended in the pillar of cloud, and he stood at the entrance of the tabernacle, and he said, Aaron and Miriam, and he called them, and they stepped forward. Now watch what God says. And the Lord said, now listen to what I say. If you were prophets, if there were prophets among you, I, the Lord, would reveal myself in visions, and I would speak to them in dreams. Whoa, wait, wait, stop. If there were prophets among them, look at Exodus 7, verse 1. Aaron and Miriam, what does it say? The Lord said to Moses, pay attention. I will make uh, you seem like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron will be a prophet so he was a prophet, but notice God didn't even respect his office. When you get into criticism, God will look at your ministry and he may not bless it. He may not acknowledge your gifting. He will remove his hand of blessing. Be careful. Don't get into criticism on social media or in the church. Be careful. Here he was a prophet positioned by God. And God said, if there be a prophet, in other words, I'm not even respecting your office. I'm not even <laughs> absolutely acknowledging the prophetic office I gave because you got over into pride and you got over into criticism and you think you're something. Be careful. That's why if you can never receive correction from the pastor or leadership over prophetic words, you are in a dangerous place. All right? And Miriam, Exodus, I think it's Exodus 15, 20. Is that the one? Look at Exodus 15, 20. And Miriam, the prophet. Oh, she was a prophetess. So why would God say that? Because they got over into the wrong spirit. And if you get over in the wrong spirit, you'll prophesy out of a wrong spirit. And God said, I'm not even going to speak through you. I'm not even going to speak to you. But now go back to what God then said about what separated Moses from them. A, humility. So it's character over gifting. Too many people make it about gifting. I got this great gift. So-and-so has this great gift. Yeah, but you know what? I will never, I have people all the time say, and, and listen, being, <laughs> Brenda, you're watching. Listen, I've been around the who's who of the who's who. Yes, I know most of them. And people say, well, why don't you invite so-and-so to the church? They're so anointed. Yeah, they are. But they're dirty. Or they're so stinking prideful, they suck the wind out of every room they walk into. And heck no, I'm not inviting their prideful self to this church. They, 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 have, they, they don't have character. Okay, only five people clapped. But, <laughs> but notice what God said in verse 7. He said, not with my servant Moses, of all my house. He's the one that I trust. He's the one that I what? Whoa. He, he was saying, I don't trust Miriam, and I don't trust Aaron. And if you're constantly running your mouth of criticism and acting like you know more than, than the other person. I've had people come in here, and they'll say, well, Pastor Hank, you know, in my church, I was the one that always gave tongues and interpretation of tongues on Sunday. And you give no room for that here. I said, okay, so let me get it straight. So you're the one that God spoke the tongue through. Yes. Oh. And you were the one that interpreted every Sunday. Wow, yay you. And I said to him, I said, the reason why? I said, I have a responsibility. I'm not Pastor, you know, John Walton of Walton Mountain Family Church. I have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands that listen every single week. And God is speaking something greater than you wanting just to get up and give your tongue and your interpretation. And if God wants me... To yield to you, I would, but your spirit's off. And I haven't seen them since, but anyway, it's okay. <laughs> but you know what? God trusts me. That's one thing I can tell you, and I am not prideful in saying so. God trusts me. Amen. Does he trust you? If you don't have the right character, he won't trust you. But back up. Look at verse 6. Why did God trust Moses? Look at what Moses was after. 
If there were prophets among you, I, the Lord, would reveal myself in visions, and I would speak to them in dreams. And then God said, keep going. What do you say in verse 7? But not with my servant Moses. All of my house, he's the one I trust. Okay, look at verse 8. Why? Why does he trust him? I speak to him face to face, clearly, because Moses was after the greatest thing that you can go after. It's the heart of God and his face. It's not that God speaks to me and I'm this great prophetic voice and leader. No, God's not impressed. He doesn't trust you. He trusts you. You know why? He trusts you with his words because you steward over his heart. That's why I don't share everything I know or feel. I don't try to push for a gift. I'm not trying to be anything. Neither should you. Go after his heart. Go after his face. Amen? That's what, that's what caused Moses to succeed. Amen? All right. Now, I want you to look here. Look at Acts 13, verse 22. I'm going to wind this down. I'm going to close this up. Acts 13, verse 22. It says, and when he removed him, he raised him up for them, David, a king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I found who? David, the son of Jesse, a man after my what? My own heart. Now, what happened with David? Who wrote most of the Psalms? David. And those Psalms are what? Psalms. Prophetic. Why did God speak those precious words to David, a psalmist? Because he was after his what? His heart. You go after God's heart, you get his secrets. You get mouth-to-mouth -mouth revelation, information. Are you listening? He trusts you. Now, here's the thing. When you get God's heart, remember, he shares his secret. What's his secret? I believe it's his heart. Because that's where the secret comes from. And when you steward over his heart, and you don't just go around and be, uh, you know, prophetic blabbermouth of all your dreams and revelations. Man, I remember before I was pastor in church, I'd go, I was younger then, and people would come up, and they always had a dream, always had a vision. I'm like, no, you did not. Because most of the time I'm asking God, come on, God, I want I wanted you to, you know, speak to me, man. Now, there's times where it comes in seasons where I have dreams all the time, and there's other times I'm like, uh, what up? Okay, you ever had that? Okay, but make it your heart, and God will reveal his secret. But here's the thing. The reason he trusts you or don't trust you is can you keep a secret? That's why prophets in the Old Testament had to hold on to the word of the Lord. You've got to hold on to what God tells you and know when to share it. And, that, and God's, God's so gracious, he'll work with you. But here's the thing. Okay, now look at Revelation 1. We're going to close with these, these two scriptures. Revelation 1, 16 through 17. So now John is caught up. And he's describing, he's describing Jesus. He had in his right hand seven stars out of his mouth was a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was like, or his face, I like the one word, put in the King James if they could. His face, his face, I want them to see the word face. His face was like the sun, shining in its strength. Okay, so, all right, what was he looking at? He was looking at his face. Now, go to verse 17. What happened? Verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I was dead. Okay, what did he, what did he see? His face. His face. Now, notice he fell at his feet. Why did he fall at his feet? Because that is the highest form of worship. When we oftentimes, and I get convicted of this too, I worship you. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good worship, Hank. But the highest form is if you bow down and you worship as if to kiss the ground. When Jesus talked to the woman at the well in John 4, he said, Woman, now is the time and now is that the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. You know what he was talking about, true worshipers? True worshipers were the ones that bow down as low as they can in humility and honor to God. As if to kiss the ground. What did Lucifer say? What did Satan say to Jesus? If you be the Son of God, stand there and worship me. Come on, he knew what true worship was because he used to be over it. Bow down 
Kiss my feet is what he was saying. And worship me. So what's the key when you see God's face or how do you get God to show his face? Then that means he opens his secret. He opens his heart. Now all of a sudden you become uh, inundated with the revelation of dreams and visions, the word of the Lord, is it has to come from a place of worship. Up your worship. Up your intimacy. Get your focus off of your dreams, your visions, you, your gift, why the pastor doesn't recognize you or should recognize you, right? I have this word. I have this call. And put it back on the face of God. You know why I'm standing here today? And Brenda, I know you're watching because I got a text from you. Um, She was saying, great word, thank you. But here's the point. The point is this. Brenda, you and I know we were not seeking our calling. When we tried in the early years, it didn't go anywhere. Trying to make the calling happen. We adjusted and made it about God. I want your face. And when there were no meetings and nobody was asking us to come and they were staying away by the millions... We would get a little keyboard out, and Brenda could play the keyboard, and we would worship, and Matthew, you would get your little sword out, and a plastic sword, and we would worship God and dance. Christy would do that, and she would make up songs, okay? Now, notice what happens, okay? Verse 16, saw his face. What did he immediately do? Fall down and begin to worship. Now, what's the thing that followed? Heart to heart, face to face. And then mouth to mouth. Watch the next thing. Look at verse 19. What happened? Notice the instruction. Verse 19. Write the things now that you have seen. And the things which are. And the things which will take place after this. In other words, the revelatory realm increased. Right? But it didn't happen. This was not the instruction until he saw his face and worshipped him. People wonder why. I don't seem to have God speak to me. I don't seem to be hearing God anymore. Up. Up your connection or reconnect your your power source. Go ahead and stand to your feet. Revelation 4. Let's go back there. We started with this verse. Watch this. Revelation 4 verse 1. I'm just going to close it here and I'm going to let you go. After these things I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven and the first voice was which i heard was like a trumpet spoke with me saying come up here there and i'll show you things which must come here after look at verse two immediately i was in the spirit and behold a throne was set in heaven and watch this one sat on the throne and he was like a jasper sardis stone in his appearance and there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald And the throne was 24 thrones, and I saw 24 elders sitting there clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. So he's describing now his heavenly experience when he got caught up. But ultimately, what what you could say, we use the word wrecked John. It wasn't his words. It wasn't all the things that he saw that we're still arguing over, pre-trib, mid-trib, right? Pre-rapture, post-rapture, is there going to be a rapture, Right? We look at all of this stuff in the book of Revelation. We argue it over it and all that, all the things that John saw. But you know what? If you read the book of Revelation, it's the testimony of Jesus Christ. It isn't the Antichrist. It's not the beast. It's not all of those things, even though they're mentioned. It's about Jesus. And that has to be your focus or you're never going to go higher and you're never